Welcome back to Flashpoint. Joining us now, the man with all the knowledge locally and one of our favorite guests, because he's usually one of the smartest guys we talk to, uh, Professor Michael Bitzer from Catawba College. Um, doctor, thank you as always, we appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, so uh, let's let's talk about where Chuck Todd l left off. Um, Anson County, NBC News sort of doing a deep dive on that county between now and the midterms um, because of its demographic makeup. B better help us understand why um, looking and analyzing a county like Anson is helpful not only locally but also across the national stage. Well, I think certainly the demographics of Anson County are fairly unique in terms of registered voters. It's almost evenly split between white non-Hispanic and African-American non-Hispanic voters. So in the South, when we talk about voting patterns, we oftentimes talk about the fact that African-American voters are strongly reliable Democrats. They vote 90 to 95% of the time for Democratic candidates. White voters in the South generally tend to be Republican, but in Anson County, it presents a unique factor in that there are still some white voters who vote Democratic. In 2020, for example, Joe Biden won Anson County 51 to 47 when Donald Trump won the state by 51% of the vote as well. So this kind of demographic deep dive, I think is really gonna be important for the primary process of voter turnout. And that's the crucial component, particularly here in North Carolina. Yes, there are swing voters, but the vast majority of North Carolina voters have made up their minds before they go into the voting booth. There's two aspects of this. Well, there's probably a lot more than two, but what I'm thinking about right now is you have uh, white rural Democrats, and mm -hmm. these are the folks who probably voted for Jimmy Carter, perhaps Bill Clinton back in the day, and, and they've stayed with the party this whole time. Well, a small chunk of them have stayed with the party. What we have seen in North Carolina, particularly in rural counties, is what we call a realignment of rural voters, meaning that those historic legacy Democratic voters have now transitioned to being Republican voters, particularly since 2016 and the support for Donald Trump. That has become very evident. And in a, in a county like Anson, there are still some historic legacy Democratic voters who are white that still vote Democratic, but their numbers have shrunk considerably across North Carolina and across the South. And the other aspect of this that makes it interesting is that uh, you have African-American voters in Anson County, counties like it that are rural. They are not the reliable Democrat voter that say urban uh, voters would be here in Charlotte. Well, very much so in terms of turnout. I looked at the 2020 turnout rates uh, among the, the entire county. Two thirds of all Anson County voters showed up to vote 67%. But when you break that down by race and ethnicity, white non-Hispanic voters, they showed up 75%, three quarters of them did. When you look at black African-American non-Hispanic voters, it was only 63% voter turnout. So Democrats have got to have that reliable base of voters show up at comparable levels if they want to make North Carolina a Democratic state. And, and I talked to Chuck Todd about this some, but explain why, why the Anson County would be emblematic of say a, a county in Georgia or South Carolina or, or, or other states across the South. Well, certainly the South is still dominated by one term that we use, the Black Belt, that basically starts in uh, Virginia and kind of swings as a crescent through North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, into Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. It is a high minority population of counties in that Black Belt region that really help Democrats and particularly define what a state will do politically if they should show up to vote. And I think with Anson County, even though it's considered part of the Charlotte Metropolitan Statistical Area, 
it is still very much a rural county, small, dominated by uh, minority populations, voters of color. I think it will be a key test if somebody like uh, Sheree Beasley wins the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate, can she energize that population to show up and help her secure what will, by all accounts, be a battleground U.S. Senate race here in North Carolina in 2022? All right, let's switch gears. Let's talk redistricting. Um, mm -hmm. As we always say, we always preface this, it's one of the most important topics and it's also one of the most uh, boring topics w when it comes to actually wrapping your head around. You're laughing <laughs> because you know it's true. Um, it, it's a complicated topic, but, but, but we know that the state lawmakers right now are trying to sort these uh, redistricting lines out. Um, and where do we stand right now? We, we are getting ready to get the final versions of the maps. And I think what is important for folks to know is certainly the Republicans control the legislature, therefore they control the map making process. Governor Cooper has no veto power over redistricting legislation, but the likelihood is once these maps are released and the legislature votes on the congressional and state house and state senate uh, maps, we are in all likelihood likelihood going to see legal challenges filed both in state court and federal court. We've had this dynamic in North Carolina for the past 40 years. Why not start a fifth decade with the same dynamics? I mean, how is this ever going to get resolved? I mean, you, you, you have, I mean, in the last 10 years, this got relitigated re many, many times. Um, and, and you would you would hope that our lawmakers would learn a lesson um, and, and draw up uh, things that at least a court could find fair. What gives? Well, first and foremost, redistricting is the most political activity in American politics. And because we have become so hyper-polarized, that has only ramped up the dynamics. The second factor that I always point folks to is the fact that when you use the building blocks, the precincts where people go to cast their ballots, in North Carolina, 70% of them vote overwhelmingly are landslide precincts for one party over the other. We have very few competitive regions or areas in the state. And so when you draw maps, the lines only accentuate what is already happening on the ground. So folks that you know complain about fair maps, well, define for me first what is fair in politics. And secondly, you have to acknowledge that we, the voters, have sorted ourselves, put ourselves into like-minded communities, like-minded precincts. And that is part of the issue with trying to draw, quote unquote, fair maps. The professor is always proud of, uh, of the tasks he, he gives his students to try to come up with the maps themselves. And then that's when they realize how difficult it really is to draw fair maps um, that, that everybody agrees to. Actually, you, you can't do that. So how does this how does this this fight end? I mean, you, you, you talk about how we are changing. We're self segregating. We live with only people who who, who think like we do politically. Um, and we have political parties who have their own vested interests in making sure they stay in power. Where does this end, not next year, but where does this end 10, 20 years from now? Well, I think the biggest issue that I'm going to be watching is demographic dynamics, and particularly generational change. We know that older voters tend to be more Republican, particularly among baby boomers. But the fact is that millennials and now Gen Z voters under the age of 40 have a very different perspective when it comes to government's role in things like the economy and social issues. And I think that that generational replacement over the next Next decade, two decades will have a powerful impact on how North Carolina and particularly the country votes. Let me get your quick predictions about how uh, the midterms will go next year. We're about a year out. How do you think they're going to go for uh, at least when it comes to Congress in D.C.? Um, Democrats going to stay in power? If, if you believe the history, and that's a powerful indicator, the president's party always loses seats in the House and in the Senate. The likelihood is that with redistricting going on, Republicans may be able to pick up those handful of seats needed to reclaim majority in the House. I think the Senate is going to be highly competitive. All eyes are going to be on North Carolina potentially to see which way the Senate is controlled.
This is becoming a routine thing around here for our Senate races. All right, uh, Dr. Michael Bitzer, Professor, thank you as always, we appreciate it. Good to see you. All right, more Flashpoint after this.